So hello and welcome to the October 25th, 2021 edition of the CLR Roundtable. Um, today's topic is the, the value, the values of the CLR standard. Um, I'm Dan Blickensturfer, and I'm the Technical Program Manager for Digital Credentials here at IMS Global. And I'm standing in for my colleague, Kelly Hoyland, who's traveling to Educause today. Um, we like to talk about open standards at IMS. Um, go ahead and advance this. Um, we, we typically like to talk about open standards at IMS Global really as an ecosystem of interconnected and interoperable standards. And that ecosystem for digital credentials includes open badges, the CATE standard for, for curriculum frameworks. And today's topic is the Comprehensive Learner Record or CLR. One of the key values of the CLR that we talk a lot about is the way that it demonstrates a learner's knowledge, skills, and abilities and enhances learner agency over their own academic records and with whom they choose to share. I'm gonna launch our polling questions. So I've launched a, a poll with a couple of questions. If you could take a look at those in terms of uh, where you're, the role that where you're joining us today from uh, the stage you're at at your CLR initiative at your institution um, and whether or not you have a platform. So some answers are coming in. Lots of folks from, from IT today. It's great to have you. Uh, some folks from Registrar Academic Affairs. Uh, Lots of folks are either in the planning stage or in the investigation stage in terms of the CLR. And it's about 50-50 for uh, having a platform. Give that another second. That's great. So today we'll really be diving into some of the additional values of implementing the CLR at your institution. Uh, those topics, um, those topics include the value of data to your institution, uh, identifying learning, portability of, of learning records, uh, and security and privacy. And then uh, at the end, I'll give a, a, CL, a CLR sort of update from an IMS perspective as well. So we have a fantastic panel today and the panelists will each introduce themselves as we go. Uh, I'll introduce our first panelist and turn it over to Devin Edmond, Vice President of Academic Administration, Walden University. Thank you, Devin. Great, thank you so much. Um, as Dan stated, my name is Devin Edmond, I'm Vice President of Academic Administration at Walden University. Um, and representing Walden University, I had the great pleasure um, of working over the past few years with the Lumina Foundation and the ACRO Initiative around the Comprehensive Learner Record um, and wanted to share some of the things that we've learned today that bring value outside of um, or to your university outside of the development of the CLR itself. So one of the things that um, really as it relates to academic data um, as you're working to develop your CLR and in the planning stages of the CLR, one of the most important things um, in doing that is your data infrastructure. And so working to pull the pieces together, possibly from different systems um, to really set up what you need um, to launch your CLR for your students, there is so much extra added benefit um, to that as well to your institution. So if you think about peeling back the layers of the CLR and what the student actually sees as the end result, beneath that is layers and layers and layers of fields of data. And so as you're planning or developing your CLR, there's opportunities at your institution to leverage that data. And so one of the things that um, you may wanna consider is working with your university administration um, to present what is the data that you're collecting and how you plan to display it 
And how could that data possibly be used to provide insights about your students um, that may be helpful in understanding um, your institution? So there are ways that you can plan to mine your data, um, to use algorithms within your data um, to understand things around progression. Um, you can use it almost as a research tool um, around your own students um, because you have all the data mapped and you have all the fields and you have it at the micro level, which is usually what holds a lot of us back from really understanding some of the um, more detailed or specific information that we want to know about our students. And so this is really an opportunity to have data um, in, in the smallest forms, in little chunks, um, to find out what do you want to know about your university. And so um, one of the most, the second most important thing we learned by going through um, the process with the Lumina Foundation and ACRO um, with their initiative was that the CLR is really, it cannot be done in a vacuum. It really needs to be a comprehensive effort at your university. And so you can use that to bring people into the conversation, um, not just around the data, but around what is the CLR, why are you using it? And you can kind of spin that into, well, how can we use this data um, to support other initiatives or to learn different things about our students? It helps to also create buy-in um, to your process as well, the more people who understand and can see it as a benefit, not just to the student, but then also to yourselves from a university academic um, data perspective. Um, the second um, item that you might wanna think about as you're doing that is not just how do I set my data up for now, for what my CLR, what we want it to look like now, but what might we want to know, understand, or include in the future? And so perhaps there are some strategic initiatives that are part of your university strategic plan um, that you can kind of set yourself up for success for what you know is coming down the road in the future. And then you have the ability to use that data um, as you may need it for your institution's, institution's usage. And so there are so many opportunities when you have um, a data repository that has been pulled together um, to use it in other ways. So I would really encourage everyone to think about how you can do that um, and who you can help bring on board um, to see how you might be able to use that for moving into the future. And so Suzanne, I wanted to kick it off um, to you for the next topic. Thank you so much, you so Devin. Much. Um, appreciate that you, you laid that out so nicely. Um, and I'm excited to kind of talk about this because I, I think, um, you know, when you think about how can CLR identify what learning is happening, um, I mean, that's that's why we're doing this. I mean, that's part of the institutional effectiveness 2.0 initiative that's going on in higher ed. Um, I am Suzanne Carbonero. I am the director of academic partnerships at APHIS, and APHIS is a unified platform for assessment management, um, institutional effectiveness, and student learning journey. And I'll, I'll get more into that in a moment. One of the reasons why I left higher education about two years ago was to work more closely with IMS and APHIS to support other institutions across the US who are trying to solve this problem of practice. How do we unpack the learning that is happening in real time? So I embarked on CLR at my institution because we did need to unpack the evidence of student learning in real time to intervene and support students who needed help meeting the benchmarks um, to help students progress um, and to help students identify those areas of concern and growth before they stepped into their clinical rotations within a pharmacy education program. So, um, so fast forward, I, I came to, to APHIS and what we're seeing now um, is an expanded learning continuum as a catalyst for students who are interested in post-secondary education um, in the form of all different realms, um, not just the degree, right? So certificates and micro credentials that help them see the skills in real time that are actually giving them opportunities to practice authentic assessment for learning linked to what they would be doing out in the job. Um, no longer are students just diving into that degree program 
absent of intention, um, or even as I said directly, students are accessing education with that clear intent to practice these skills to help them be more successful and employable. And so with that value proposition front and center, uh, folks that we're working with in higher education are shifting their programs to make these skills and skills practice more explicit in their pedagogy um, and in their programs. So some of the current challenges or problems um, include how do they measure the competency. A lot of times, um, I mean, this could be happening right within their um, their approach to identifying key assessments within the courses or the co-curricular experiences that um, give students this opportunity to demonstrate skills. Um, and then we need to track this across the curriculum. So for those of you that might be mapping according to developmental levels, introduction, reinforcement, um, emphasis, for instance, within Blooms, we can start to see through that curricular mapping process where you know some of the breakdowns could be occurring. And then students have the ability to share this uh, data with employers. So comprehensive learner records solves a lot of these questions for institutions. Um, and we're also providing students confidence in the evidence that they are sort of generating um, through their coursework and co-curricular activities, because now they can see it in real time and perhaps maybe even apply for jobs that they had not considered before because um, they didn't have access to their own learning data. Oftentimes it was sort of locked away in the learning management system or um, when you think about the progression through a degree program, it was a series of check boxes, right? That I have to take this course and I take this course, I have to get this grade to continue on. Um, this is much more than that. This gets into that deeper dive that Devin introduced here. So at AVIS, we're committed to supporting your institution to demonstrate educational impact through this unified platform for assessment, management, learner success, and continuous improvement to activate authentic lifelong learning. And I think CLR is the building block. So when we think about it, CLR begins with a with a backward design approach. It's actually a four step process that I'll kind of walk you through. It starts off with a, a review of your digital catalogs. So what data are you collecting in your, in your student information system that we can leverage and pull into APHIS to help you um, run reports you know, for your accreditation, but also um, to kind of get a sense of the types of courses and co-curricular experiences students would be enrolled in. Um, so that's important. And then the other piece is what outcome sets are you aligning to? Are you using the NACE competencies? Are you using, um, you know, a set of, of skills uh, that are, you know, part of ONET? Or what, where are those skills coming from? Are they part of your institutional outcomes? Are they linked to the mission? Are you using value rubrics as your set of institutional outcomes? So it's like, where are those outcome sets, bringing those into APHIS and allowing Allowing you to do your curricular mapping across all different types of learning. So the idea is that number two, you're going to digitize your curricular map, link those competency frameworks or outcome sets to your curriculum, to your programs, to your course learning outcomes, and then link those course learning outcomes to the key assignments or other assessments that students are generating as part of their regular coursework, as part of their clubs and, and leadership opportunities, as part of their uh, civic engagement. We're working with institutions that have initiatives around high impact practices, so you can link that. Number three is, you know, to link that authentic evidence of student learning and other prior learning artifacts and life credits to CLR. So um, identifying where those experiences are, linking that to that chain of, of outcome sets, as I said, again, knowing where those outcome sets are and actually bringing them into APHIS. And then comprehensive learner record reinforces that learning happens everywhere with verified evidence of student learning from courses, co-curricular engagement, student employment, and even stu student self-identified experiences. And so like utilizing the IMS global CLR standard, 
Um, the AVIS CLR is an interoperable and, and portable record, enabling um, students to share this with employers and um, through, you know, a variety of um, various platforms through the JSON standard, which is, you know, the, the, the JSON file, which is the IMS standard, uh, you know, social sharing and whatnot. And AVIS is the first ed tech company to be certified in that standard. Um, so I, clearly in my example here is pedagogy is the driver of these initiatives. Um, and, you know, when we think about technology, technology is an accelerator. But I want to point out something that Devin mentioned. That's collaboration. Collaboration is the key to the ignition. We are working with institutions like University of Maryland, Baltimore County, University of Minnesota, and University of Kentucky, as well as some others who are seeking to create comprehensive learner record, which pulls together all of this learning that I've been describing, those, you know, the learning journey, the courses, the co-curricular, the extracurricular activities. But let me tell you, the journey of that CLR does require that collaboration with various stakeholders at your institution. Many of them are on this call today. Day. And special shout out to registrars and provost offices and folks that work in career services and at the dean level. I mean, folks, you are all involved in this because it, there's an intentional curricular mapping and assessment plan that goes with your CLR initiative. Um, and the intention of how you're going to use that CLR at your institution. For instance, CLR can trigger interventions to support learners as they progress through the curriculum. Um, like my example early on in pharmacy education, we needed to be able to drill down to the individual student questions on an exam or the individual rubric criteria to see if students were able to actually um, complete the skill uh, required of them to, to advance in their health profession program. So um, by triggering learning support, if you will, you're saving students time and money in repeating courses that they're not successful in because you can do this in real time. CLR also serves as a self-reflection tool within your general education program. Um, and it can support your accreditation requirements while also enabling students to seek and find those jobs related to skills. Regardless of your intention, it's important to have one and maybe you grow your intentions. Maybe CLR um, begins to form some sort of stickiness at your institution and, and you grow from an intervention to maybe one or two programs using it for jobs. Maybe it's part of your high impact practices that you're moving forward. But ultimately, it takes people, a plan, and a set of principles to guide um, this process to fruition. And I want to turn it back over to Devin. I know you want to talk a little bit more about portability um, and how CLR can be shared with other stakeholders. So I'll, I'll turn it back over to Devin. Yeah, absolutely. So as we think about all of the things Suzanne just talked about in terms of curricular mapping um, and how we, how we set that up within our institution so that um, when the students go to present their CLR out into the world, um, they have all the information that they need. One of the other important things about utilizing the standards is that we also need to think about how could we at our institutions be the consumer of someone else's CLR? And so um, as being good stewards and building CLRs to the standards um, to make sure that the student has all the benefit, it's also really great to engage in a conversation with your institution and with your admissions office, with, with the recruiting teams around, well, how do we begin to accept these and accept the information from them? So it's not just how do we build the CLR to put something out that's great that the student can use. There also at the same time needs to be conversations around how do we also then accept those into our institution, accept the information that comes from them, how do we make sure there's an awareness of what this is and how we can use it? Um, because if that's going to fit in with kind of the strategy for your students, you want to make sure that you can equally be prepared to accept them in and understand, you know, what does that mean? Um, there's a lot of other benefits around portability um, that um, using the standards brings. And I think Chris was going to speak a little bit more um, to the portability piece um, as well. So Chris, I'll hand it over to you. Great, thank you. Um, and thanks again, everyone, for um, being here today. Um, good to see a lot of new names that I haven't seen before. Uh, my name is uh, Chris Houston. I am with um, Strategic Education, Inc. Um, 
which uh, owns Strayer University and Capella University. Uh, and previous to the merger from a couple of years ago, I've been with, uh, with Capella University for probably about eight or nine years now. Um, as a, uh, and uh, I'm a senior IT business analyst. So I, I fit in between the technology side and uh, the business or academic side of things. So I get a good uh, picture of both sides. Um, I'm also a former chair of the CLR um, working group going back, um, I think some of my connections um, when I started participating in some CLR things go back to about 2016 or so. Um, but primarily I kind of fit the role of this liaison, you know, between, between the two kind of sides there. Um, Capella originally had interest um, in, in, the, um, in the CLR because uh, Capella is a pioneer in competency-based education um, and looking for, you know, other ways to solve that problem of how do we, um, how do we break down what a, lear what a person or a learner knows even much greater than just say a course grade. That will only tell you so much. However, um, with competencies, there's statements of you know, what someone can do or know. And, um, and so Capella had a, a program called FlexPath, which is really more based on, can you make your way through these competencies and master them along the way, as opposed to um, you know, more of just your traditional course grade. So in some cases, the course doesn't matter as much. It's more, can you make it through these particular uh, competencies? And there's not really a great tool for that in the, in the market today, or at least there had, you know, wasn't, you know, several years ago. And um, uh, so this originally was called something called like an extended transcript to break out some of these further, more granular, you know, nuggets of learning. And that really show you what a learner can do or what they know. Um, and so uh, I'll talk a little bit about the security here. Um, I, I will say, you know, first of all, for port portability, before I talk about security, is that it's, um, you know, it doesn't do much if just one person does this and they in internally do it within a school. You need that interoperability. You need that to be able to make sense of it. You know, if I send it to another institution, you know, will they be able to make sense of it if I share my achievements as a learner to um, potential businesses, uh, companies, um, you know, seeking employment, you know, are they going to be able to make sense of it? So, I mean, portability is, is you know, all, obviously goes along with security too, because you don't want to expose your data um, in a way that could come back, um, whether as an institution or as an individual uh, learner um, for, for the obvious reasons, right? But, um, so it, it does need to be portable and interoperable so that both sides can really, you know, make sense of that data. Um, and, um, you know, there's been sort of a concept these last few years where competencies can actually act more as a currency. But again, for a currency to actually work, you have to have some level of standardization, um, you know, in, in any industry, I guess, I suppose. Um, for security, I'm not sure if I like the question about balancing need between learners to share their achievements and, and being able to need to protect their data. I think you kind of have to do both. Um, obviously protecting the data from an institution level is non-negotiable, you know, because of FERPA and things like that. There have been a lot of um, advances in the last few years, several years, decades maybe, around cryptography and things like that, that are good tools to help um, an individual or even an institution, you know, um, to be able to, to encrypt or secure that data, even through transport in a way that, um, you know, doesn't expose it, um, you know, to those who don't have access to it. Um, and part of what I like about the CLR in general is that it is, in a way, a tool that could enable better learner agency. And what I mean is that I think we've, this, this current transcript model that's been going on for the last hundred years or so is you don't necessarily always own your credentials or your, you know, what you've learned because, um, and I think Suzanne or uh, Devin made mention of it earlier, it's either still in the LMS or SIS or some other place. And 
And even if you request a transcript to be sent somewhere, well, it's school generally sending it, it's not that you have it and make a copy and send it for the most part. Um, so there is sort of this, you know, I went to school for however, however many years and I should have access to that and be able to do what I want with it and share it in a way that I might want to. Um, and while there are probably ways to do that today, it's, it's still uh, sort of stuck in this older paradigm, I guess. And, um, but where that's going is, is to be able to give the learner more self-control over you know, their accomplishments and their achievements. Um, and yes, there are tools today to do that, such as LinkedIn. Um, and, you know, some of the problems there have to do with, well, how do you verify that data that's on LinkedIn? And, you know, how do you qualify it and, and things like that, where I think the CLR helps solve some of those problems as well through this independent verification of these, um, it, um, you know, individual achievements. Um, let's see what else. I, I think one thing that can also help this in the future is there are some emerging technologies coming out now that are around um, this concept of a wallet, a learner wallet. Um, I know with the pandemic, there's been, you know, discussion around things like, you know, uh, proof of vaccination and, and things like that too, where even Apple, I believe, came out uh, with a something called an Apple wallet. It's probably built or based off sort of their pay uh, mechanism that they have, but it's it's being extended out to give, you know, more control over sharing and more information around this um, to, to be able to control that more from the individual wallet holder as opposed to, you know, the institution or, or you know, having to work with the institution to maybe share some of that data. Um, and um, I, I can't really say too much about the Apple wallet because I don't know very much, but it's being extended in, in those kind of ways to be able to, uh, you know, be able to prove things to, to others, um, such as a vaccination, if you will. Um, and I know that that's just one of them. I think there are a lot of other ones that are kind of coming out these days and You'll probably hear other fancy terms around blockchain and you know uh so don't get too confused by some of that those are just you know other other ways of kind of securing or you know keeping that data private through the use of encryption for the most part and um you know i, I think that's going to be um kind of the way out of some of this is yeah i mean the institution has to keep their data secure but if if you enable the learners to control their own data and share it where they please um, and there are even tools you can add on to that. Um, things like um, links that might expire. Um, I know even, uh, I think Google has a certain way to do that where you can set up a link um, that you give someone access to it, but then expires you know, quickly where there are ways to kind of control that afterthought of who's seen your data um, as well. Um, let's see. We've, Chris, if um, I can just add on to something yeah, sure, that you absolutely. just mentioned. Yeah. Um, I think that um, it is not to be underestimated that that can be a big paradigm shift for a lot of institutions, kind of thinking about the student as the owner of their record versus the institution as the owner of the student's record. And so while we see, as you mentioned, that there are a lot of things happening around us as customers and as consumers of products that are kind of this more, you know, like the wallet that you mentioned. There's a lot of places that are doing things like that where it's, you know, pulling everything together into one spot to allow you that kind of control. Um, but depending on uh, the culture of your institution or, you know, the culture of your institution's leadership team, um, that, that may be something that's held sacred is control over um, access to the student's record, whether it's for financial purposes or um, whatever else. So um, just my comment into everything that you, you said there is really that can't be underestimated. And it may have to be part of your build out in terms of getting people used to this idea that this is, this is happening around us. Um, there's, there's other conversations around um, interoperable records um, and things like that, that people may not be as familiar with as us as registrars or administrators 
um, or technologists um, may be and maybe not as open to it. So that that might just be a spot where um, there needs to be some intention and strategy around even understanding um, what is my institution's um, you know ability to think differently um, about this. Yeah, thank you, Devin. That's that's a great to add on there. And and, and that's right. I think what, another way of saying that is this can be a disruptive technology. And um, disruption on its own isn't really ever good, I guess. Um, but you know that has been sort of the, one of those buzzwords for the last few years, and and this really could be a, very disruptive. So. Um, and I think that stresses the point of getting buy-in from, you know, multiple departments, multiple areas at the institution. Because while one group may wish to go down that path, you know, it may be right against some other, you know, uh, part of the institution that maybe they hold that part sacred. Right? Um, there could be revenue that's generated through some of this as well. Something else to keep an eye on. Um, and so, yeah, tread lightly there, or at least at first, but those are kind of the things to be conscious of, you know, as we work with your uh, different stakeholders within uh, an institution. Fantastic. Yeah. Um, I can, I can uh, pick up the microphone there uh, in terms of a, a, a quick update for from a, an IMS global perspective uh, on, on the CLR standard itself, sort of state of the standard. Um, on, and I'll start by saying the CLR standard is really, it's ready for you to use now. It's ready, ready to be adopted. Um, Devin, I think maybe Suzanne spoke to the fact that the American Association of Collegiate Registrars and Admissions Office or Officers or ACRO has issued guidance to its members to adopt the CLR standard um, for comprehensive learner record projects and products. So that's a really, that's been a really good uh, moving of, of it forward. Uh, and those product companies have access to the CLR standard, as I mentioned, and there are now five different suppliers certified for CLR, including APHIS, uh, who's with us today. Uh, to find out more about sort of what that landscape is, the, the IMS product directory at imsglobal.org slash certifications, and we'll have resources after, after the fact, but uh, certifications has a complete, uh, complete details about um, those, those products and platforms. Um, and I'll, I'll have that in the resources after the session. Uh, a quick note about certification itself. Uh, it's, it's really, and this is a, kind of ties back into all of the values that we've been talking about today. It's really essential that the product you choose is certified to support those values, security, portability, uh, and especially interoperability with other systems exchanging CLR. Someone, someone said uh, a little bit ago about the sort of limited utility of having a CLR kind of internal to, to your institution. There certainly is utility in that, uh, but so much more utility when you're able to exchange. And I think Devin mentioned sort of consuming the CLRs of other institutions uh, and interoperability is really what enables that. Um, again, from an IMS perspective, we, we're, we're really here to help. Um, if you could please let us know either Kelly or, or myself, uh, how we can help with your CLR, CLR implementations questions you have. Um, we we would love to do that. There's a there's there's a lot of uh, developer uh, information that's available to IMS members that we can share. Um, one last item around kind of the the current state and the future. Uh, the work of the CLR or any standard for that matter is really, is not really done uh, at any given moment in the sense that open standards are part of an iterative iterative process. Uh, that needs to continue to support what institutions and learners need as, as time goes forward. And I think the, the, um, the recent landscape of, of change external to institutions in the form of uh, the pandemic has kind of pointed, pointed out that the things change. Um, one example of the, that iterative process in the digital credentials area, which includes open badges and the CLR, uh, IMS is really determined to make these standards as compatible as possible, especially around emerging digital wallet standards, as, as uh, Chris mentioned. Um, and this is really interesting too, because in Chris's discussion of 
uh, the, the ways that exchanging of health data is one driver uh, in secure digital credentials. That's uh, in the current work in the IMS project work groups, which is the, the way that these standards are kind of driven forward, IMS members collaborating and, and um, working on the, the direction of what's next, uh, those emerging digital wallet standards, uh, particularly verifiable credentials or VC, which is a, a specification that already exists in the world, uh, digital healthcare records really are driving that. Uh, and that's the that's the direction we're we're moving forward as well with both open badges and CLR, um, and work has begun to to support that. Um, I'll pause there, and I think we can we can go directly to Q and A. If folks have any questions? I don't know if there are questions in the chat. But I, th I think everyone can unmute themselves if they care to. Let's see. So one question that I had, um, and we, I think, I feel like we talked about this a little bit, but I, I wonder, and I would ask this of Devin to start. Um, Devin, I wonder if you have any additional advice for others uh, working to implement the CLR at their institution from an institutional perspective. Yeah, so um, the biggest piece that we really kind of found was around the data infrastructure, mainly because at Walden we had we have different systems where things live. Um, we have competency-based education um, that lives in one set of systems. And then we have our you know, regular traditional course-based uh, courses that live in, diff in separate systems. And so it was really, you know, how do we bring all that together? But I think um, going to what Suzanne was talking about a little bit um, is the amount of pre-work that needs to be done to even engage your collaborative team members in a conversation around the comprehensive learner record. So really understanding, you know, how is academic data stored? How is assessment data stored? Um, what is collected and when? And is it in a mechanism where we can extract it? So, you know, one of the big things that we learned um, as part of the project was that we did not have our outcomes and assessment data um, set up in a way that we could easily extract the pieces that we wanted um, or the pieces that we needed to be part of the record. Everything existed, but though the infrastructure that it was in um, was, was not something that we were gonna be able to use to pull from. And so now you're starting to talk about a whole separate large scale pro project around, um, well, how do we get that information into smaller pieces and into an infrastructure that allows it to be extracted, which in and of itself is, a, um, is an undertaking. You know, luckily for me, that was something that our institution wanted to do and that they had realized they were at the point where they, we needed to do that. And so we were able to kind of bring them into the conversation, but um, that's another large piece. Um, I think just the, the third piece of that too was really under, making sure people were speaking the same language um, when it came to some of these different things that maybe we talk about openly or as registrars, we have a, a kind of a more granular understanding. Um, but what I found was that when I said um, the words digital badging, um, that there was a different understanding of what that was, what it meant, how it was used um, with different people that I spoke with. And so really understanding how to make sure that um, my words make sense to everyone the same way and that people have a common understanding of what some of this vocabulary is um, and how um, it's being referenced as part of this project. That's great. Um, there's, a, there's a very much a, a related discussion in the chat, a really great discussion around um, uh, the, the initial question is who, what are the chickens and eggs that need to align in order for CLRs to realize their most meaningful adoption? And Suzanne has a great answer around, you know, the, the stakeholders that really need to be involved 
uh, and there are many, whether it's uh, from IT and instructional technology, career center, academic affairs, faculty development, student affairs and registrar, um, all of those stakeholders needing to be part of that uh, is very much something that we've seen. Um, does anyone else have any questions for the panel or any questions at all? Hi, this is Sean from Michigan. Um, just on that last point, um, given the, the intensity of the prep work that needs to be done and the alignment of the different stakeholders and so forth, um, I'm wondering if, if anyone has experience coming at this from uh, not so much the academic side of things, but from the staff development side of things, um, your organizational development groups, your institutional HR groups, there's a lot of, um, at least to my mind, uh, similarity, if not overlap, with the sort of skill development and tracking of those skills and competencies. Has anyone started with that constituency and, and built out an institutional strategy that, that later expanded into the academic side? So we have not done that. However, we have had conversations around, you know, how do we create thinking around um, faculty development, certifications, different training programs that folks go through. How do we create um, something on a similar platform um, so that as um, staff members and employees um, that we have something that's centralized that we can use. So it has been part of the conversation, um, but we have not taken any steps further, you know, in order to take action on that. But it is a good point, and it is something that has come up in other CLR conversations around, well, how can we potentially utilize it internally um, as well and see the benefit from that? Yeah, I have a couple things to add on to that too. Um, probably the best example might be IBM. They've been, they started with digital badges, you know, probably many years ago now. And one of their goals was to internally upskill some of their own workers. So they built a program around digital badges to be able to, you know, try to, you know, like I said, upskill these just in time for particular projects that, that they may need that certain skill set. That itself has then kind of uh, been expanded to towards back towards the academic world though. And um, again, I don't know too much about it. I know they've got, I think at one point they had an agreement with Northeastern where there was some, um, uh, you know, transference between credits and, you know, particular digital badges. Um, I'll say Capella's looked into this to a certain degree too around, um, you know, how can we use this to, to better help our own staff or student learners or um, other things, you know, like that as well. And, um, and it's very attractive. Um, that one, you know, other, other priorities sort of took over and that uh, kind of got put on hold for the moment, but, um, but yeah, that's a it's a very interesting idea too, or another usage of, of this type of a tool. I think on that piece, just one quick thing to add, I know as it was part of our conversation is around ROI. And so if you think about um, if you're considering, well, do we do something internally or do we do something that you know the student can then emphasize? If you think about it too, it's really all part of your branding. Um, and so as the CLR. Um, is something that is put forward by your institution, your branding gets out there and students are sharing your branding. Um, just like how we have you know, electronic diplomas that are shareable on different social sites and things like that. And so I think part of the conversation will be, well, what is the ROI? And if it's kind of a toss up between these two things, and that's certainly part of the conversation. Um, one benefit of, of doing it internally is that you're almost, you can be using it almost as your own pilot and your own test of what works well, getting feedback from staff. Um, and so that could be, for some institutions, that could be very attractive to be able to do that internally before launching something externally, um, which again, will have your brand on it and, and be out there. So there's there's definitely pros and cons um, to both, but I know the, the ROI and the branding was a big part of our conversations. That's a great question, Sean, thank you. Um, do folks have other any other questions? 
and I'll pause before I jump into mine that's now in the top of my head. So I'm curious, and th I think this might be a question for Chris to start. Um, I'm curious about uh, sort of from a, from a IT analyst perspective. I think the barriers either witnessed or or foreseen in terms of systems talking to each other. If that's something that that you have any thoughts about? Yeah, absolutely. And I won't get too technical here. Um, just because the audience I know is, is probably mostly not technical, but I, I did actually look like maybe we did have quite a few. Um, so um, I will say that's probably one of the bigger challenges here. Um, and it's what makes doing a CLR as sort of an after fact, not, you know, like after the fact is not necessarily a good idea. You almost, and that might be a way to start, right? But in order to do it in a scalable and, um, uh, you know, more permanent way, yeah, I mean, there's most institutions I'd imagine are going to have some problems to solve around that. And it's because data is in different silos. And I will say that going through the process of a CLR, it does make you understand, you know, it, it almost needs to be very purposely built in a way, just like, say, back, backwards design curriculum does as well, um, it, to be done in a more deliberate way with knowing you know where your data is at, at all points essentially and then being able to know how to add, aggregate those together um, if they're not in one central system you can obviously create a new central system and dump stuff in there there's probably lots of different ways to implement it but i will say that's probably one of the bigger challenges and it's probably a challenge that doesn't get looked at very often until problems arise because your data is siloed so this is a nice um in a way, you have to be very proactive about that um, and working with your different stakeholders, um, in particular architects and things like that around, you know, how do we how do we start small yet also be able to design it in a way that can be scalable and, um, you know, grow with, with the institution? Yeah, I think the question too around what is the source of truth um, versus having everything in a place, in a repository or a warehouse um, that is a big part of the conversation. Does data get pulled somewhere specifically and then it's pinged based on wherever it's pulled? And then how does that work with whatever the initial um, you know, source is? Um, how do things get updated? What do those integration layers look like? Um, those are really important conversations because if your integration layer has a crack in it at some point, um, then you have outdated data or you potentially don't even know that there's data that's not pulling appropriately you know, into where it should. And so um, the architecture mapping is really important. It's also important to make sure that at your institution, you have folks with the right skills to do that. Um, and so depending on what your IT de departments or your resources may look like, it may be best to have um, someone who is an expert in architecture mapping um, to be able to help with that. You know, luckily, we have significant expertise within our institution um, to be able to do that. But it is um, lots of charts and graphs and errors pointing all different ways and making sure they understand the flow of information. You know, for some of us, we, we need those also for SOX controls and different things. So um, that piece can't be underestimated, like Chris says. It, it really has to be a thoughtful design process um, to think through not just how do we set it up, but how does it get maintained um, and how do we know um, what the source of truth is um, for any given piece of the data? That's great. Any other questions for, for our panelists or for me? So we, we will be sending out uh, resources when Kel Kelly's back from Educause, she'll be sending out um, some follow-up and please, please do let us know if there's anything we can help you with. And uh, many, many thanks to our panelists today and thank you for joining us. Take thanks. care. Take care.